Good evening, everyone. Hi. Can, every, can everyone show thumbs or something so we know we're being heard? Awesome. Phoebe, you're getting really good at it. <laughs> Give everyone a Just wait a, well, we're still a few minutes early. I see people still coming in. So we'll just wait a few more minutes. Thanks everyone. We'll give it just a couple more minutes if that's okay with everyone. Yeah, Donna and Donna, do you want me to just? I was just going to say, sure, that would be great, Kathy. Thank I'll, you. I'll, you know, just checking in. We we have members of the building committee, but not a quorum. So I will just introduce you then um, and turn it over to your team. Perfect. Vivian, I think we dress like twins today. <laughs> it's our office uniform. Whack. Well, splashy color. But that doesn't, that has no reflection on me. Yeah, I know. Just want to say, <laughs> we're all very happy here. <laughs> Kathy, if it's okay, we'll wait a couple of minutes. It looks like some people are still coming in. Sure. They had a hard time finding parking. <laughs> <laughs> it's cute. That is that is the beauty of this, right? It it's we love to be in person, but this certainly makes life easier for so many.
Kathy, your call. It looks, oh, no, there's a few more. So there may be people will be coming in. It's up to you if you want to wait a few more or try to get started. And Well, I know, I know you have a, a, a well-orchestrated uh, time. So, so why don't we start? And okay. uh, so I just want to, I want to welcome everyone. I'm Kathy Shane. I am chair of the elementary school building committee, and um, we are basically hosting this tonight. The Danisco design team is going to present um, and conduct a community forum. And as I think most of you know who logged in, there'll both be a presenta presentation, then there are going to be breakout rooms for small group discussions and coming back. Um, we're very excited. There are several members of the building committee here to be at this point where we're going to be hearing some early findings on uh, the condition of the building and sites, some of what we're going to be looking at on different kinds of alternatives and development of the education plan. It's all the beginning phase of this project. And I think with that extremely short introduction, Donna, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining. Um, just give a quick overview and introduction of our team. Um, my, my name is Donna Danisco with Danisco and Rick. Rick Rice, I guess we're going to do this quick. Um, also, we have Vivian, who will be leading one of the discussions, one of the breakouts. Tim Cooper, who will be leading the sustainable discussion. We have Brian, uh, Colin Finch, our project architect. And then we have Brian Hunter, who's the man behind all of this magic. So blame him when my computer crashes on me. Um, Margaret Wood, I didn't see her come in. I didn't see um, her come in. Yeah, so, and also as, as part of our team, we also have Margaret Wood with Answer and she's our owner's project manager. And if she, if she does join us, I'll, I would like to introduce her as well. She's an integral part of our team. Um, but with that, I guess what we can do is um, just get started um, for this evening. So thank you and welcome everyone to our first community forum. We've had two visioning sessions with the community. We've met with the staff. We've had other conversations with staff uh, regarding Caminantes and some other programs. Um, and we'll continue those conversations. And we have a last visioning meeting coming up and we'll have additional community forums as we go along. And now this doesn't want me to advance, so here we go. So this evening, really our focus real briefly, we'll talk about the MSBA process. They're an integral uh, team member, an important team member as part of the project. Um, Tim will talk about the site information, what we've learned, as well as your existing conditions from both buildings and both sites, actually, Wildwood and Fort River, as well as both buildings. And then what we'd like to do is break out into two sessions. One is going to focus on sustainability, net zero. What does that mean to your community and how we can get there? Um, can't see the next slide. Can everyone see my next slide now? Donna, it's still on the cover, so I'm wondering it? if... Yes, the agenda slide. So apologies, everyone, we're having a little- So bit. this one is not showing? No, you may need to get out of it and reshare. <sighs> right. Sorry, folks. So the man behind the curtain. Um, all right, let me stop sharing. Thank you for telling me that, Vivian. We've only rehearsed this, I can't tell you how many times, so. Um, Try again. I will try one more time. I think part of the issue too is when we're presenting, we can't see the slides. I don't know why this is very frustrating. <laughs> All right, how's this? Yes, okay. perfect. All right, so uh, we'll talk about the MSBA process. Um, both the information that we've obtained both on the Wildwood and Fort River sites and buildings. And then we'll break out into two sessions. One will be focused on sustainability and net zero energy and how we plan on accomplishing those for the project, as well as breaking out into another session, which is more a visioning session. And it's going to help us be informed by what's important to you, what your project aspirations are as a community, and um, helping us 
understand what the pri what's important to you from the, pri the priorities that have been established for the project. All right, let's see if I can do this then. There we go. So the first part, real briefly, um, we have MSBA as a very important partner in the project, um, but they do have a prescribed process that we have to adhere to. So although we're sitting in 2022, what we're, um, our goal is to have the project completed by August of 26, so that the final solution, and I'm gonna use the word new tonight in that it's gonna be a renovation addition or a new construction. Um, but the new facility will be delivered for the students to move into it by August of 2026. But there's a lot of parts that and, and processes that need to occur as we go along. So as part of the MSBA process, they have eight modules. Um, we are now in module three, and you've completed the eligibility period, which determined that you were going to look at uh, Fort River Elementary School only um, with a reduced enrollment, as well as a 575 uh, student school with a combined enrollment uh, with uh, Wildwood for 575. Um, as part of the feasibility study, we have two submissions. The first one is the preliminary design program, which we'll be submitting um, mid-March. And then what we'll do is after we submit the PDP, as we call it, we will continue to summarize the process with the preliminary and final evaluation of alternatives. We'll have a cost comparison for each of the options, or we'd like to even call them concepts at that point in time. And then in June, we'll be submitting the preferred schematic report to MSBA, which will document the preferred solution that will be the most cost-effective and of course, educationally appropriate solution to MSBA. Once we submit that, we will start schematic design and schematic design will be focusing on the preferred solution, which will determine the final design program, a cost estimate, a detailed cost estimate, as well as layouts of the floor plans, the preliminary overall plan for the site and the building, as well as specifications such as building materials and site um, criteria. And we hope that MSBA will be approving it sometime in February of 23. They have not yet established or rolled out what their schedule will be for 23. We're a little ahead of them right now, but normally this is about the timeline that occurs. After MSBA votes to approve your project, which really outlines the project scope, the size of your building, the cost, and the reimbursement from MSBA, the district or the town has 120 days from their approval to secure the funding for the project. Uh, once you secure the funding, MSBA will issue or you'll enter into a project funding agreement, which details how much money they're going to participate in, what the project scope, schedule, and costs will be. And then we actually get into the more exciting, more detailed design of the project. So right now we're focused on the very first two phases, the preferred schematic report, which we'll have complete in June, and then MSBA will vote on it in, at the end of August. And then we'll be working on the schematic design, again, submitting to MSBA in December with their vote sometime in February of 23. So this is where we are. PDP, um, how are we gonna develop the PDP or what's part of the PDP? We will finalize the educational program. We have really used all of the effort that you have gone through over the past several years. And we have validated it with visioning sessions with the staff, as I mentioned, we've had several conversations and we'll continue to have those. We have not quite engaged the students yet, although we've gotten some great input they want swimming pools and slides. So um, this will be a fun conversation with them, families and the community. And then we have started the conversations meeting with stakeholders as it relates to sustainability, of course, the educational components, design features, 
And here we are having a conversation with you all this evening as the start of our community outreach in addition to the visioning session. So it will be really important to continue to obtain your feedback as we go through the process. Tim? I, I would also, I'm going to interrupt just real quick. I think Mike Morris, uh, Superintendent Mike Morris, has joined us as well. So thank you, Mike. Um, and Tim, I'll turn it over to you. Now we're going to talk about the uh, two sites that Amherst is lucky to have to evaluate and consider to, which would be better for the project and uh, the buildings themselves. Uh, so starting with the Wildwood site, um, it's a 14 acre site that was uh, made level when the original Wildwood school was built. Um, it has a single point of access that it used to share with access to the Head Start to the southwest part of the site. Um, there's parking to the north of the building in the west and play fields to the south. And then south of the entire site um, are the play fields and practice fields for the regional middle school. Um, on the east side of the site, there are some steep grades and some mature trees that uh, make that part of the site unworkable really for a building. And then there's also some steep grades getting up to Strong Street. Uh, the entire site is about 14 acres, but uh, when you take away the things that have to remain access to the Head Start, uh, areas where you wouldn't build uh, due to topography, there's probably about 11 or less left over. Next. Oops, sorry. Uh, yeah, so here's just a summary of the site aspects. Um, there's a single point of access on Strong Street. Uh, can't really introduce any more curb cuts because of the hill. This will limit our ability to control traffic uh, and make the intersection work a little bit better if we do select this site. And the existing building is about 82,000 square feet, which uh, is probably about 20% 20 20 smaller than uh, a new building would be, whether renovated or a new, a new building. Next, please. So this is the Fort River site. Um, basically an identical building, 82,000 square feet on a larger site. Um, this site has two points of access, which allows traffic to circulate through the site a little bit better, but the Northern exit, which is pointed to, is very close to a major intersection in town, which presents its own traffic issues. Um, the site is adjacent to a river, uh, which provides for some opportunities for outdoor education and natural environment, uh, but that also comes with its own limitations. Uh, what is shown on the screen now is the flood prone conservancy zone, uh, which is a zoning limitation, um, which we will respect as we consider new development on the site. Next, please. There are also other limitations. This shows the current definition of the floodplain associated with the Fort River. That definition is currently under review and it will actually be revised uh, if all things go as scheduled this year um, to a, a, a much less in inclusive part of the site. So the floodplain restrictions will move back, but there are other restrictions that we need to talk about that would limit where we could place a building on the site. So this shows a riverfront setback and wetland setbacks that we would respect, obviously, as we uh, consider any development on the site and they all reach um, almost up to the existing building. Next, please. So here's an overlay of all of those, uh, except for the floodplain, which is in flux, and they limit the developable area. So if you take what is a 30 acre site and take out of play the reasons, the part of the site that we would use to avoid the regulatory and uh, setbacks, we would uh, be limited to about 11 acres, which is still a good amount of site to work with and will allow us to do everything we need to do, uh, but we can't use the entire site. And when I say we are limiting the site. Um, we're basically talking about the building. The areas that are shown in the setbacks will still be available for outdoor recreation, play, outdoor learning, and many of the community aspects that the site can be developed for. Next. Uh, one more, please. So these are the two sites side by side, uh, like I said before. 
and HRSA is very lucky to have two viable sites that we will continue to look at and evaluate and see which is the most appropriate for the project for all of the reasons that we will consider. So now we're going to talk about the buildings that are on those sites. Uh, the buildings were both built in the early 70s at a very different time in terms of our attitude about energy, about how we teach in schools. Uh, but because they were built at the same time by basically the same design, uh, they have very similar issues that would need to be addressed in a renovation or uh, a new building. Uh, they both have envelopes that do not perform well when measured for energy efficiency. Uh, the outside walls are brick with block backup, which has almost no insulating value. Um, the buildings do not comply with ADA or MAAB, the Massachusetts counterpart to that. So um, if the buildings are to be reused, there will have um, buildings do not meet the requirements of ADA. Um, and to correct those deficiencies, there would be renovations required. Um, Ironically, the next item is security. Um, there is limited ability to control access at the front door of the buildings. There is an A phone now or an iPhone um, where you can buzz in, but the lobby is not designed for secure entrances at the second door, which would norm which would be locked in a school that is built in today's environment. Um, and there are also classrooms that have doors to the vestibule. So um, today's standards in terms of security do not exist in these buildings. Um, the buildings are large in one story, so um, there are not a lot of windows. Uh, so you have poor daylights and the mechanical systems are from early in the 70s. Uh, they do not function to today's standards. So thermal control is not available the way we would like it to be. Um, another artifact from the time that the buildings were built is open classrooms. Um, which give you a lot of space and that was handy during COVID, but um, it's not good for acoustic separation and it's not good for teaching in general. Um, there is inadequate ventilation in the buildings due to the age of the systems um, and all of the systems in the building, whether it be electrical, fire alarm, uh, heating, ventilation are beyond their useful life. Um, there have been made some upgrades uh, to boilers, uh, things like that, but they are not usable in a new system. And then the systems that have been maintained surprisingly well by the maintenance and a facilities department um, are so old that it's impossible to maintain, upgrade, or get parts. Um, and also due to when the buildings were built, uh, there is for materials that would have to be abated, uh, including the glue that holds down the floor tire and the ceiling tile, um, if there were to be a renovation in the building. Next. So a picture of Wildwood on the outside it shows the uh, existing brick. Um, it's in decent shape in terms of weather, uh, but uh, it, the thermal performance is nowhere near what you would expect for a building and what we would expect today. Um, the windows are also single pane in aluminum frames um, in various places throughout the buildings and both of the buildings, they've been attempted to be upgraded with uh, polycarbonate plastic, if you will, uh, screwed with another layer to the frames, but uh, it may have a marginal increase in performance, but it, marginal like this, and it also limits the amount of a daylight that can go through. Here is a picture of one of the large classrooms in Wildwood. You can see that uh, spaces have to be defined by furniture because this classrooms are too large for a single class. Um, there is limited storage. Um, you are looking toward the back of the classroom where there is a light well to let in, but there is not that much light that goes in. Um, there is a sink that doesn't meet ADA standards. Um, next, please. Here is one of the teacher workspaces, uh, the administration, the teacher workspaces, and all of, or I should say most of the non-classroom spaces are in the interior of the building. Many of them lack windows uh, and the corridors to get to them are narrow. Uh, this 
space and shot is uh, indicative of the condition of most of the building. Next. Uh, here's a picture of one of the retrofitted windows, um, basically plastic held in place with wood that is uh, attached to the existing wood. Uh, it's just not going to perform the way um, you would expect a, a building to. Next, please. Here's a picture in one of the multi-fixture toilet rooms. There is no room for a person with a disability to turn around. Um, so I, I think basically um, the rest of the presentation, which will be available for everyone to see, is just additional information on the existing Fort River building, which really isn't much different than what you just saw over at Wildwood. Um, so what we can do now is, I think everyone has a flavor of the buildings and of the sites. Um, what I think might make the most sense is if we go into our breakout sessions and we'll be doing that by um, selecting, we're trying to get Mike Morris back in, I apologize. Um, we, we can break out into our breakout sessions. We'll put half of um, you into Vivian's breakout session who will um, be talking about the aspirations, priorities, and what's important to you as a community. And the other half will go with Tim. I will stay back as other people start joining the meeting. After 30 minutes, we'll switch breakouts. So you have the opportunity to meet with either Vivian or Tim, who you didn't see for the first section. And then we'll all come back and join together for a wrap up. Um, what you'll see is if we'll, I think, probably a good idea. I really apologize. We'll take a few minute break, um, maybe rejoin at 7.07, maybe a five minute break, 7.07, 7, let's just say, um, so we can make sure that we have control over the breakouts as well. And then we'll reconvene. What you'll see when you come back in five minutes is a little note on your screen that will say, join the breakout room. So just click on the join the breakout room. You'll be brought or transformed right into Vivian's breakout or Tim's breakout. We'll talk for about a half hour. Hopefully it will be an interactive session and then um, everyone will come back and join this for a wrap up. So hopefully we can um, continue this. We sincerely apologize why uh, someone broke through our security here. So if we could just take a five minute break, when you come back, you'll see the click on the link to get you into your breakout session. Hi, everyone. It looks like people are still coming in. Wow, that was unsettling. I'm speechless. <laughs> Anyhow, um, let's hope we don't run into any more of those issues, particularly in this small group. But you know what? In this smaller group, I can see all of you. So, <laughs> uh, Paul, I think you missed it. Paul, I thought I saw you. Are you still on? With some other excitement. Oh, in I any heard case, I'm here. Yes, great. Thank you. Welcome, welcome in. So, um, so just to, Vivian, are you running this section? So if something I, happens, you're controlling it. I am. I'm going to do my best, and I have okay. Colin here also. Colin, you want to say hello, to everyone? Colin's from our office. Hey, everybody. So, Thank you. Colin, if you see anything untoward, just feel free to boot folks off. I will. All right. Awesome. Okay. You know what? I'm going to set my well, I was going to set my timer, but uh, Colin, you're going to be my timer at this point. So thank you so much for making the time to join us tonight. Um, we just wanted to talk a little bit about Heather, Heather Sheldon. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Okay. I'm sorry. I'm going to probably be asking along the way. In any case, um, in the past several weeks, we've had the great opportunity to 
talked to many folks and talked to the school department about some of their priorities and aspirations. And as we um, start the design process, this is really an exciting part of the project where we get to talk to you and many more people, stakeholders, and get some input from you as to what you see as the greater community for the new school, whether it's a new construction or a renovated school. Um, during the next few minutes, we're gonna be talking about some aspirations as well as talking about some of the priorities that have already been established. So I am going to share my screen with a little bit of trepidation. Okay, can everyone see a tile sheet? Again, it's hard. It, give me a thumbs up if you can. I've got, okay, Colin, we're good. Okay, great. Just gonna, let's see. Oops. So what I would love you to do is if you have a computer that has a second screen, um, even if you have one, it's a little more difficult, but for those of you who have joined us earlier on Visioning, meetings, this is a way for you to participate um, without having to speak. We'll also have an opportunity to do a little chat at the end of this if, there, if the time permits. But uh, if you have an iPhone or a smartphone, you could take a picture of the QR code and that'll send you directly to the Menti site or type in on a separate browser, the menti.com. And Vivian, that'll take, yes. You're, uh, you're frozen. So can you restart your screen share please? Did that change? Okay. I am not sharing anymore, but I. Yeah. There you go. Whoops, no, Whoop. I jumped off. Okay, let's try this again. Did anyone let Jennifer in? She was just on a second ago. Okay, how's that? Okay, Colin, I can see you squarely. So you just give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. All right, is everyone on Menti? This will give you an opportunity to participate um, just by typing in some thoughts, questions as we go along our way. Okay. So again, as we met with folks and um, talked to the uh, greater school com community, there were many um, ideas that came out and some of these are just givens. For instance, you know, as we look at designing a new school, a renovated school, we'll be looking at definitely designing for uh, universal access. We'll be looking at safety in terms of just uh, uh, pedestrian children access pickup, as well as the safe use for the community. We'll be looking also at green spaces, and uh, that's for children, students, uh, as well as for community use, and then also connectivity to the community. Hey, Vivian, I think we are seeing just your Mentimeter screen, not your um, PDF. So are you sharing your okay. browser or here, it just always sees the Menti and the QR code right now. That again, maybe third time's a charm. On the, on the Mentimeter, it is advancing, but not on the shared screen. It's, yeah. Oh, I see. So in your whatever device you're looking at, right? Okay. All right, let's try this again. Do you see photographs of buildings? Okay, I'm not gonna touch anything else. <laughs> All right, so as we start to think about a building design, I think many of us have preconceived ideas of what a school might look like, right? For some of us, it's a, 
it's got to be a brick building for others. We want it to look progressive because we want children and staff and the community to get excited about learning and the future. So the people come to the table with many different ideas. As designers, we don't wanna to come to the table with any preconceived ideas. So we wanna hear from you as to what you, what, what do you think of when you think of a renovated or a new school for this community? And here's where you'll have the opportunity if you are on Menti, um, give us some of your thoughts. What is your vision? How do you see the school um, working? How do you see the school looking, um, fitting into the community? Just provide some thoughts that we can then share with the larger group. Light-filled classrooms, yes. Natural daylight is so important. We, we know that we get better outcomes when the environment is um, healthy. And yep, I see a theme here, light. Yep, filled. Flexibility. So uh, community resource, awesome. So the school as reconceived, I guess, uh, the new design renovation of the school is going to be for a, potentially a, a larger population than what you know now. Our goal is to create a school that is, um, has a scale that is friendly to children so that even the youngest child can feel like this is their space, it's not overwhelming. We want to also foster community. Um, yep, climate action focus. Yep, so the next uh, breakout group, you'll have an opportunity to talk also about uh, climate and sustainability. Open and wide hallways. Awesome, these are great, thank you. Okay. I'm gonna close this and then we'll go on to the next slide. Designed for children and unique needs. Okay, so I saw community as a couple of the uh, pieces of the puzzle here. And yes, when we design schools, schools are not standalone buildings. They really are part of a larger community. And as such, we really want to create spaces that encourage um, a lot of use of the school. We often design gyms that are regulation size gyms. There are oftentimes rec departments that like to use um, or, or, or need gym space, right? For basketball and uh, assorted activities. Um, we design cafetoriums that have performance areas that can be used definitely at times that um, school is not in session. And media centers, we now design them to be flexible. So furniture can move, um, tables and chairs can move, even decks can move so that it can accommodate larger groups um, or even meetings. Um, and lastly, some of the classrooms are uh, able to be used by the community if there are after school or before school programs and even weekend programs and language programs. So, what are some other thoughts? How, how else do you see the community using the school? And this is kind of um, looking at interior spaces because we'll have an opportunity to talk about the outside. For those of you who just joined us, if you jump on to Menti and use this code, you can also participate. We've got a couple more slides, but in this case, we are talking about how different spaces or the school can be used for community. Public meetings, yeah. Climate resistance hub, yeah. And we can talk a little bit more about that at, at the next breakout group. Meetings, yes. We have a school, um, a middle school actually that we designed with a media center that was large enough to, to hold um, building committee meetings and school committee meetings. So these, these facilities are designed with um, 
great connectivity. So the technology also even allows uh, televising meetings if the need arises. Yep, community meetings after hours, awesome. Great. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Colorful, yes. That it will be. Okay, so not only is a school building designed with spaces that can be shared, but the, the school, again, it sits within a larger site that also will be shared with parking. It's, it's an, a necessary evil, right? We live in an automobile driven um, world, but there's gonna be parking and playground space for the children. There's an opportunity for community gardens. So we've heard that also from our visioning sessions. There's also uh, the opportunity to, there's also the opportunity to do um, outdoor learning, right? In, in the case of gardens um, or even creating outdoor classroom spaces. Okay. So, We'd love to hear what your vision is for the site. Aid and shelter. This is awesome. Basketball, yep. Kids really need outdoor recreation space, not just playgrounds, not just swings, right? Shade and shelter. Awesome. There's so many opportunities because of the wetlands and the river. Um, and just by the nature of being where the buildings sit. Blooding Hill, I love that. All right, thank you. Um, it seems that I probably talked too much because we are about to jump back into a different group. So I am going to leave you and you get Okay, hang, hang on, we're joining another group. Hi everyone. We'll give it a, another 30 seconds to make sure everyone's joined. Um, yeah, no, that was kind of short too. So, um, okay. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Great, thank you. And let me see, I am going to try to share my screen. Um, give me a minute here. Can you all see my, what is your vision for the site? Awesome, okay. So sorry, this was from the last session. I got totally cut off. So I'm going to move forward and try to get through this quickly. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, what I wanted to do tonight is uh, give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about your aspirations and your vision for the new school. So in the past several, uh, you know what? You guys were on Menti prior to this, right? So you'll need to jump off that mentee and sign into this one because this will give you a different set of sl uh, slides to comment on. So when you guys are on, give me the thumbs up and I will keep moving. All right, I'm gonna keep moving and there's gonna be an opportunity. Thank you, Jennifer. 
Um, on the next slide, you'll still be able to enter the mentee number if you miss it this time around. All right, so in the past several weeks, we've had great opportunity to talk to stakeholders and school community members to um, talk about some of their aspirations and what they would like to see as part of the new or renovated school. Some of these are givens, right? Of course, we're going to design for a safe, um, safe drop-off pickup, safety all around the school and within the school. Um, those areas that are used by the community as well, we'll be looking at safe use. Um, we will be designing for universal access to the school and universal uh, design for learning. And then we're gonna provide some spaces that could potentially also be shared by the community. So, when you think of a school, a lot of, I think a lot of people think of a school building as maybe a, a brick building, a red brick building, right? The little, little red school. Um, some, some folks may also think of a, a school as being progressive because we're in the 21st century. We want our children to be inspired to learn and, and go far, right? With um, technology and just all the things that they will pick up in terms of learning at the school. So there are many ways to approach the design of the school. We, we would oftentimes, we pull in traditional bu building materials and incorporate them in new ways that um, really sends us to the future. So as you think about a new or renovated school, what is your vision for the building? So this is where you'll have the opportunity if you're on Menti to type in, I, I don't know if you're on a separate device because on a phone, you can kind of see the presentation as well as what's on Menti, but why don't you provide some of your thoughts for how you envision a new or renovated school. Yep, natural non-toxic materials, yeah. And we will definitely be looking at building a school that meets sustain sustainability guidelines. Lots of light, that seems to be a theme. And most definitely, because we know that natural, natural daylight really does add to the ability for children to, to learn in a, a positive and healthy environment. Central Library, kind of what is there now, right? With the Wildwood and Fort River Schools, contemporary. Yes, and definitely flexible. So what we do now is we design, uh, what we know so much more now than when I was a child is that every child learns differently. And you know, every child then, what we wanted is create the spaces that can accommodate all the different types of learning. And that does fold in furniture as well. Great, thank you. So as we design these new schools, even renovated schools, we look at spaces that can be used a lot. And we look at how these spaces can be shared with the community. We often design gyms that are large enough to accommodate basketball games, right? Regulation size gyms. Um, we design cafeterias with performance spaces so that these spaces can be used outside of normal class time. And we also design media centers with, with furniture. I think someone said movable furniture earlier so that the furniture can be moved off and we can set it up for meetings, community meetings, or even um, small group performances. And of course, classrooms. We want to also accommodate any community um, programs such as after school or before school programs. So as we think about community spaces, what is your vision for community spaces? What are some of your thoughts? everyone. 
So um, the MSBA who partners with us, as Donna had mentioned earlier, does now um, provide in their program requirements a STEM type space. So we know how important that is and more and more schools are folding in the arts into the whole STEM program. So now we call it STEAM and STEAM can incorporate art. It could also incorporate fine arts, which is where the performance comes in. Different zones, yeah. Again, um, libraries are designed so that whole classrooms can be brought in to use uh, the spaces as well as uh, individual one-on-one uh, -on -one teaching can also occur in these spaces. All right, I'm gonna move on. Okay, and again, when we think of a school, the school is just part of a larger community, right? It's part of the fabric of the community. So when we are looking at the site, the siting of the school, the, the school is going to share the site with parking and it might be a fairly large parking lot, which we typically want to separate from children's play areas. We provide um, multi-use uh, play areas where there are play structures as well as places for children to run. But often there are other features that we fold into these, um, these outdoor spaces. There are potentials for learning uh, outdoor learning, community gardens that can be shared by the community. Um, in this school here, we have um, walking paths. And that's this, uh, this is a plan of it that takes you from the little pond area over here over uh, to the neighborhood. So um, there are natural resources around both of these schools that we would take advantage of and just make the connections. So again, as we look at the outdoor spaces, what is your vision for the site? It could be as simple as I just want some walking paths. I wanna be able to walk my dog through. Um, this back area. Kids should be outdoors. <laughs> yes. So um, the COVID has really challenged educators in so many ways. And as I drive around the communities, I see all these outdoor classrooms, right, that are literally set up with indoor classroom tables and chairs. So I think as we start to look at the outdoors, we are gonna look at how we can be really um, flexible in how we use the outdoor space. And I think it could be built in furniture, but again, in flexibility, it could be um, um, logs that are cut down for little benches. There are many different ways we can approach the site plan and the design of it. Yep, gardens and playing fields, absolutely. We also design um, playgrounds. Sometimes, again, children have different social skills and some kids don't like to be with the fray of all the excitement and they like a little quieter space. We've created um, sensory gardens that incorporate musical instruments. So again, these are features that not only the children who attend the school can use, but the greater community can really take advantage of. Yes, play areas for children. So the other um, great thing about renovation and new construction for sites is that we design the entire site to be fully accessible. That means um, someone in a wheelchair, someone who has difficulty walking and maneuvering um, will have the ability to do that. We don't, uh, we, we design play spaces with surfaces that would allow that to happen and, and slopes that are gentle enough that would meet the accessibility guidelines. Okay, gonna move on. 
So as part of our visioning sessions and also working with the um, stakeholders, we've, uh, we have a set of priorities that have been established and these are um, on, on the screen. You know, equity seems to, is, is a very important aspect of designing the schools and that's equity for students as well as the community and um, we'll consider the redistricting impact. So we will be looking at the two sites, right? The Wildwood and Fort River site and we will be um, assessing and evaluating which site makes the most amount of sense for the new or renovated school. And these are all the components that we'll be considering as we um, look at which site makes the most amount of sense and which building program makes the most amount of sense. So um, these are what's been established so far. So we would love to hear from you to see what your priorities are. So out of these eight in the next slide, you're gonna be able to use your Mentimeter and vote for your top three so that we could kind of get a sense of what's important to you as a, as a community. And then we'll have an op opportunity for you to actually, we can chat if the time allows, or you can also plug in what you think might be missing and other considerations. So there are eight that we talked about, equity, educational program, fitting within each option, and construction cost is always going to be a consideration as well as operating costs. And then the future expandability and flexibility. And finally, traffic, how does the school and the, um, the capacity of the school impact traffic? And then the community use and net zero, yes. So I think you all came from the sustainability conversation, right? So that's definitely an important aspect. It's great. Yeah. All right. So what I'd like to do is, oh, people are still voting. Okay, I'm gonna give you 30 more seconds. Okay, great. Educational program fitting with the option. Absolutely. The school design should be educationally driven, right? It needs to work for these the students. And these are all really important priorities that we will be considering. Okay, so are there other priorities that you think we've missed or that you think we should add? Love to hear from you. And if you'd like to unmute at this point too, we can also have, we can also chat about everything climate-related, yeah. We want the teachers and the kids to be happy in this building, absolutely. And also as a community, you know, we wanna be good neighbors as well. Anything else? All right, so I would love to open this up. If anyone, I'm not sure if you can raise your hand, but we could um, unmute if anyone wants to ask any question, raise home values. Yes, we know that a school really does impact, it really does have a, a great impact on the neighborhood and the houses around it. And yes, absolutely. The Comandante's program is really a key aspect of the school program. All right. Any other comments? Yes, Phoebe, please. Hi. So I wasn't sure how to write this, um, but I think 
given what we have experienced in the last couple of years with our schools and with COVID and everything else, I think it's really important to think about, um, you know, if, if this kind of thing were to happen again in the future, um, or if something of this magnitude were to happen again in the future, how do we best deal with that within our schools? Um, are there ways that we can, um, you know, I think environmentally deal with it as well as uh, ways to make kids more comfortable and, and sort of the list goes on. So I wasn't really sure how to <laughs> write that yeah. in a very small way. I think it's, um, it's, it's being resilient, right? And sometimes we think of it as being climate resilient. So as we design systems, we want to be cognizant of definitely the immediate environment and um, whether, again, you know, at Fort River, there is a river. So we, we want to be sure we're respectful of that so that what we design really um, uh, would deal with any potential flooding. But again, as the, I think the flood zone is getting uh, reestablished and redefined, um, those are really huge considerations. Thank you, Phoebe. And yes, definitely. So what we cannot do is design really large classrooms. Um, I think that the current Fort River School has kind of redefined classrooms given the COVID. And those are pretty big, but you know, the MSBA does kind of limit the size of classrooms to uh, 900 to 1000 square feet for typical general classrooms and slightly larger for kindergarten. So we work within those confines, but we also design flexible spaces so that when kids need to move um, away from a larger group, we have the flexibility to do that. But again, that's that's coming up. It's gonna be great. Um, we'd, we'd hope that you'll all join us for additional community meetings as the design gets developed so that we can gain some more feedback from you all. Any other questions or comments? I think we are probably going to get booted back into the main group, but So there will be opportunities also, if you have questions, um, I, if you're not aware already, we do have a website where we will have our presentations uploaded. And um, there's also ways that you can ask questions and participate. We have a lot of upcoming meetings. So um, if you go onto the website, there's a calendar that will point you to the different meetings that we'll have. And, We'll have a follow-up community forum as well as um, a follow-up community uh, a visioning session in a couple of weeks. So that will be a great opportunity to um, kind of summarize what we've learned and hear from you as to what you think we've missed. And again, um, this is an iterative process as we continue along design. We, nothing is gonna be set in stone, not until those final construction documents are done. All right, so we have about 30 seconds. And um, again, thanks for joining us. And stay tuned uh, while we get zipped back into the, uh, the main group. All right, did I? I didn't miss anyone, did I? I don't see any hands. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Hi, everyone. Um, people are still coming in, so we're going to give one minute. We're just going to have uh, a chat here about the uh, sustainable aspects of the building. Um, So there's a brief presentation that I'm going to go through just to talk about some of the assumptions that we made and the um, direction that we have so far um, and what this building is going to be and the decisions that are going to have to be made as we move forward through the process.
Can everybody see my screen? Rick, maybe if you wave. Okay, there we go. All right. So as part of this breakout session, we're going to gather some information from you uh, with an app called Mentimeter, which you can open in a browser or on your phone. Uh, you go to the website that is shown there, menti.com, and then you're going to enter that number, and that will allow you to participate in this discussion. Um, we were hoping that we might also be able to um, have a real discussion. We'll see how that goes, unfortunately. Um, there are probably not enough Menti questions set up to have the uh, depth of conversation that we were hoping to have. Um, so jumping right in, um, the school will be um, a net zero energy school. Uh, that is a goal that many communities strive for, but by virtue of the uh, bylaw that Amherst has already passed, um, it's going to be a given here, which uh, is commendable in a lot of ways. Uh, just to define net zero, in case anybody knows, this means that the amount of energy used on the site will be equal to the amount of energy produced on the site over a given period of a year. It doesn't mean that at any one time, uh, this site will be completely self-sufficient. The building will be on the grid, will be connected to the utilities. Um, so if you were running an assembly on a cold winter night with all the lights on, you would definitely be using more energy than the solar power panels, if that's what we use, would be generating. Um, another product of the town's bylaw is it will be all electric, meaning there will not be gas-fired boilers, there will not be heating oil used. This will contribute greatly to reducing the carbon footprint of the building and any emissions associated with it. Uh, there is an exemption in the town bylaw. Um, the generator essentially can be powered by diesel fuel or natural gas, um, just for the sake of reliability and in case um, it's needed. Um, some of the ways that energy might be produced on site would be photovoltaic cells. Um, which are shown here in the school we did over the parking lot. And they can also be on top of the building or other site elements. Uh, there are other ways that energy can be produ produced on site, but um, photovoltaic panels, solar panels are the most likely result. Um, the school will be aiming for a target EUI of 25. 20 EUI is energy use intensity. Uh, it's a measure of how much energy the building used and measured in thousands of BTUs per square foot per year. Sorry, there's a bit of a delay on advancing the slide, so. So to get to net zero there, you have to approach it from two directions. One is um, you have to produce energy on site and the other is you have to use less energy on site. So the ways that we use less energy, um, well, there's a lot of facets. Um, this chart shows the typical school in Massachusetts and how much energy it uses. It would have an EUI of 60. So to get to that, our target EUI of 25, there's a lot of things we have to do. We start with making the envelope more efficient. We use windows that have a higher insulating value. We put more insulation in the walls and roof. And then we have a commissioning process that makes sure everything is running smoothly and that the walls are built and function the way they were designed. Another way is we control the loads on the electrical and the mechanical systems. So we control day lighting so that less electrical lighting is needed. We use LED lights, which use vastly less energy than any old lighting sources, be it fluorescent or incandescent. We use smart outlets that turn off at night. Uh, so uh, there can't be any phantom energy use. Uh, and then we also use occupancy sensors so that when a room is vacant, the lights go off and the heating can be set to uh, economize room. Uh, another way that we reduce energy use is the design of the entire system itself. So. Um, we use heat pumps, which is an efficient way. 
of moving heat around a building and getting it into the building from the outside. And then we also have energy recovery systems that uh, when ventilation air is exhausted from the building, we'd like to uh, grab the heat in that, that we've already heated up and put it back into the air that we're pumping into the building. And then we have ways that we um, monitor uh, submeter. So you might monitor separate parts of the building, separate uses of the building, maybe this is the kitchen. Uh, and all of that information allows us to better control and react um, a more efficient building. And then the last column here is approaching the problem from the other direction rather than reducing the energy use. We are generating energy, uh, most likely with photovoltaic panels. Um, there are a lot of options and decisions that we're going to have to make as we move through this. Um, if we don't have boilers uh, to create heat in the building, there are other ways that we can get heat. Basically, we're going to pump it out of the air or pump it out of the ground. These are two general types of systems that we use, um, and they have pros and cons for each. Uh, ground source heat pumps basically drill wells into the ground, pump water through those wells, and then extract heat from those wells to heat in the winter and um, pump heat into those wells for cooling in the summer. Um, that kind of system has high upfront costs, but it's very durable and very efficient. So there has a decision that has to be made there. Um, another type is air source heat pumps, which is functionally similar to um, an air conditioner but it works both ways. Um, so there is lower upfront costs with those, but um, there is more maintenance costs and they have to be replaced sooner. So as we design the project and develop the budget and reconsider priorities, we will be moving through and making the decisions on the system that will help the town meet its net zero energy goals. Um, this slide just, illustrates that because there are so many moving parts, the system, the design, the energy use, the energy production, a lot of the decisions that are traditionally made in the design and construction process have to be moved earlier in the process. Um, and that there is a more sophisticated building control system, a BMS system that um, operates all of the mechanical systems in the building. Um, it can turn the lights on and off. It sets the heat. Um, it is and can be complicated, but the complication of the system can be customized to the users because there are systems that are as complicated as you want them to be, but if they are too complicated for the users to understand or use effectively, they won't be used. And so then you've built in complication that will make you're building more efficient, but effectively you've made it less efficient because those controls will never be used. Um, as part of a building project with the MSBA, the building will be New England CHIPS or LEED certified. Um, so that has requirements in many facets of the project um, that will make the school better and more efficient. Um, Obviously there's energy efficiency. Um, under here there's transportation, which uh, basically means access to things like bike routes, public transportation, uh, sustainable sites, which means you are not developing a new building in a green field. So this is a reuse, which is viewed better by LEED. Uh, there are water efficiency, which we achieve through all sorts of things, including low flow toilets, metered faucets, um, uh, materials and resources means that we use sustainable or naturally uh, harvested materials. Um, and then indoor environment quality is measured in a manner of ways, including daylight, including air quality, including acoustics. And then there's also innovation points that we can earn by making the school a teaching device, essentially making the school part of the curriculum and doing what we can to teach about the school's impact in the world, whether it's through the environment and our carbon footprint or the embodied carbon of the materials used to build the building. 
And then we will also be controlling daylighting um, in a lot of different ways. Um, if the building is multiple stories, we can introduce light wells to get light through the middle of the building in a more effective way than function currently at Wildwood and Fort River. Um, we have modern windows that can control glare and the design of the spaces themselves, including the height of the windows, where they are in relationship to the room, the depth of the reflective surfaces on the window all control how much light gets to the students' desks, to the classrooms themselves. And what we're going to try to do now is give you all an opportunity to, um, I was going to say ask questions, but I'm, I think we may have locked down everyone's mic. Um, but you can type in questions into the Menti app or another browser window. Um, give it a minute. You can also type questions into the chat if you are not having success with the Menti. This breakout room is going to close in about uh, a minute. I truly apologize. This should have been very conversational. Uh, we've heard that a lot. We certainly want to make sure we do everything to get this done. And we've seen a lot of people that show up that want that to happen. So we think it will. Daylighting, outdoor education. We've certainly heard that a lot. Um, and we are going to make that part of the project. Daylighting classrooms and other spaces, absolutely. Okay, hang, hang on, we're joining another group. Hi everyone, um, we should be shifting through here. I think everyone's here. Hi, uh, sorry for the awkward transition between rooms. Can everyone hear me? If any nods go, there, there we go, perfect. Um, as you did in the other room, there will be a Menti question that we could uh, use for a little feedback at the end of the group. Please notice that the number is different in this room. So if you want to contribute to the conversation that way, um, just make a note of that number or enter it now. And then we're gonna do a, a quick walkthrough of the sustainable aspects of the building as we see them now and as they will progress so this building will be zero energy capable uh, thanks to Amherst bylaw, which uh, puts you at the forefront of communities in Massachusetts. Many towns strive for this. We... There's no slide. I'm oh, sorry about that. Okay. 
Can we see that now? Excellent. Tim, could um, you reshare the, oh, sorry, could you reshare the mentee number? You said it was different, but I, I think because we didn't see the slide, we didn't see the new number. Thank you. Sure. Sorry about that. And then now that it seems everyone can unmute, um, I would like to invite you, uh, you know, at the end of the presentation, we're going to have a, attempt a conversation. Um, there's also the feedback for mentee, but um, I, when conceived, this was supposed to be a conversation. Um, if anyone hasn't seen that yet, it will be there available at the end. So as I was saying, this uh, will be a zero energy capable building um, next to the bylaw. That means that the energy produced by the building or used by the building, I should say, will equal the energy produced on site over the course of the year. Not, that does not mean at any one time, the building will not be drawing energy from the grid. If you're having an assembly on a winter night, obviously, the lights and everything going on in the building is going to use a lot more energy than can be produced by the solar panels. But um, it will be an all electric building, meaning there will be not uh, fuel oil or gas fired boilers in the building or any other equipment uh, that will help considerably with the uh, carbon emissions of the building. But it does pre some, present some limitations in terms of the limits of the mechanical design. Um, there is an exclusion for the emergency generator. So regardless of the system, um, there will not be a time where in an emergency power is not available. Um, there are multiple ways that power can be uh, generated on site, but the most likely is gonna be solar panels or photovoltaic cells as shown over the parking lot here in another school that we did. But they can also be mounted in other places on site, whether it's outdoor structures, uh, the roof of the building. This is not necessarily what a uh, solar array will look like. And then just one more thing to point out on this slide. Uh, we're targeting an EUI of 25 or lower. Uh, EUI is energy use intensity uh, measured in thousands of uh, BTUs per square foot per year. So to reach that target at 25 EUI, um, you have to approach the building from uh, multiple facets. So uh, this slide shows what the typical school in Massachusetts uses in terms of energy. Uh, you'll see that's an EUI of about 60. So we have to be considerably lower that to have any shot at getting net zero. Uh, to use that energy uh, there, well, let's we'll start with the envelope. The walls have to be insulated. The windows have to be higher performing and insulated. So does the roof. Um, and the commissioning in that bar refers to um, a process of checking that things are built as designed and performing as designed in terms of insulation, infiltration, and all of the, the protection from the outdoors that the envelope should provide. Uh, we also have to think about this building in terms of the loads on the mechanical systems. So we control daylighting so that electrical lighting can be used less. We also use LED lighting throughout the building, which is far more efficient than older types of lighting, be it fluorescent or incandescent. We use smart lights, smart outlets, so that there isn't a phantom load at night for things that are plugged in that aren't necessarily working, but anything with a transformer on it uh, draws power overnight. And then we also have occupancy sensors throughout the building that control lighting and heating when not in the room. And then in addition to controlling the loads on the system, we design the systems themselves to be efficient. We use heat pumps, which are one of the most efficient forms of heating and cooling buildings, and then energy recovery systems. So as we bring air into the building and heat it or cool it, we then exhaust it out of the building. But on the way out, we'd like to transfer the heat or the energy uh, to the new air coming in so that we don't uh, waste all of the energy that we just spent. Um, we also monitor, control, and uh, oh, excuse me. Um, with all of the things that we are trying to control, we have to monitor them all and uh, make sure that we're living up to the design. That's what the submarine airing and set points are. Um, there are a lot of different types of heating systems um, and they all have pros and cons. Um, and the ones that will allow us to meet the net zero energy goals, um, you know, have a wide range in that area. 
um, without boilers or any other way to produce heat by burning fossil fuel in the buildings, we have to get the heat or energy from somewhere. And typically that's from the air or the ground. So ground source heat pumps um, essentially drill wells into the ground, uh, circulate water through them. And then that water is basically a constant temperature year round. And it's such a temperature that we can either extract heat from it or pump heat into it. These systems are very efficient, but they have a high upfront cost, uh, but they are dur durable. Uh, there are also air source heat pumps, uh, functionally similar to an air conditioner that can run both ways. Um, one of the advantages they have over ground source heat pumps is that they cost less, but um, maintenance costs are higher and replacement has to happen sooner. So, um, uh, you know, based on a lot of factors, decisions have to be made about what is appropriate for this project. Um, those decisions, you know, compared to a typical building and design process, it would be helpful if they come earlier in the process. That's what this slide is trying to illustrate. Um, we have to set goals in terms of what we want our energy performance to be and stick to those goals throughout the design. Um, and then we also have more sophisticated controls that go along with the sophisticated systems. Uh, BMS means building management system. So it's basically a computer that controls lighting, heating, and all of the mechanical systems in the building. And we like to customize that based on feedback with the users. Um, these systems can be complicated enough to control everything in the mill building down to the minute. But if you make it too sophisticated or complicated for people to use, they simply won't. And then all of the efficiency that is built into the system gets lost and you end up being less efficient because you are a little too complicated. Um, as part of building with the MSBA, uh, the school will be either LEED certified or New England CHIP certified. Um, and that comes with many aspects, not just energy performance. Um, for lead certification, there are considerations of local transportation, which could mean public transit, it could mean accessibility to bike routes. Um, a sustainable site has to be considered, or which means you get more points for building on an already developed site, what this is. Um, if you were building in a green field or cutting down a forest, that would not help you with your lead certification. Water efficiency can be achieved through low water use fixtures, such as toilets or faucets. Energy and atmosphere is the name that LEED uses to monitor energy use. Um, you also have to make sure that we're using sustainable and renewable materials. And then indoor air quality is part of indoor environment quality, as is daylighting and acoustics and all of the other things that make a space comfortable. And then we also get points with LEED if we can make the building a teaching device, among other things. Here's an example of a room where we control daylighting. And there are many ways to do that, including the size and the height of the opening of the windows. Um, this height of the ceiling allows us to bounce light around in ways that can be effective. Um, but it's not just a function of letting the most light possible into a room. We have to control glare. Tube light or differential light is just as bad as no light. Um, and so as we go through the process of designing the buildings, we will be modeling and monitoring all of these things. Um, here are what the last group typed in committee, and I am inviting you to add your own. And I would also invite you to unmute or raise your hand, which I think we have that under control now. I mean, this was supposed to be a conversation, but if, if you're more comfortable in Minty, that's why it's here.
Heather? Uh, if you're talking, Heather, you are muted. Can you unmute yourself? Yes, I was trying to see my video. I'm sorry, my probably looked goofy because I can't see myself right now. Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, what challenges there might be um, in reusing, if, if you're pursuing a remodeling scheme in meeting some net zero standards, it seems like there's some inherent difficulties or there are inherent difficulties in reusing some structures that weren't built in detailed originally to have a very um, strong thermal envelope. Um, well, you've nailed the first part of it is the thermal envelope. Um, the building Port River and Wildwood uh, Basically, they're uninsulated compared to the envelope that you would have to have. That is not to say that they could not be retrofitted and insulated. Any renovation project that we do um, is going to be major um, for the sake of getting the program to fit, getting daylight into the spaces, addressing the energy efficiency needs. Um, there is no reason that the energy goals of the town cannot be met in a renovation project, but um, there are costs associated with retrofitting. Um, and, and then also the net zero bylaw uh, has an exemption for renovation. Uh, that is not to say that we would not aim to meet the highest goals of a new building in a renovated building because once you do all of the work replace all the mechanical systems introduce daylight improve the envelope um, address any other deficiencies in the buildings in terms of uh, accessibility and whatnot uh, you're, you're almost have a new building so that's sort of a walk around the question uh, but I hope that helps a little bit And there has been a lot in Menti that I have not been reading it as I was in it's a great natural light, healthy space for kids. Absolutely. Hoping to make geothermal work that will make um, meeting the net zero goals certainly a lot easier. Uh, keep the cost to a minimizable while prioritizing net zero. That is the challenge. Flexible multi-use space. Jim, I see, I see a question about if we're net zero, do we have to care about lead? And uh, being LEED certified is actually an MSBA requirement. So it's, uh, yes, your net zero is going over and above the energy and atmosphere component, but uh, the project does have to meet LEED or uh, CHIPS, uh, the High Performance School Program. That's uh, at some point early on that the project team and, and uh, the uh, folks in Amherst will make a decision which of those two programs uh, best fit uh, the building program here. And then that's the course that we'll have to follow through uh, to get certified in either. Um, yep, repeated on the spot. I, that, I, I'm happy to see how much uh, feedback in Menti we're getting from this group. I, I can't, can't even read them as fast as they're showing up, but uh, or scrolling on my screen. Air conditioning is on here. Absolutely, there will be air conditioning. When we talked a lot about saving energy, but uh, the kids being comfortable is a given, uh, especially um, with an unpredictable climate. Uh, sufficient training for maintenance people. Yes, we will certainly make sure that happens and that that is documented so that as there is turnover in the maintenance staff, they continue to use the building at a highest possible life carbon Life cycle carbon analysis is in decision making. It will be resolved for river floodplain soon. That is in process. Try to design the large spaces to be accessible in public. Um, that is a goal of the school. Does anybody else have a question that they would like to ask. Pam, can I ask a question? I have a question. Sure, go ahead. 
So are you doing, and I apologize if this was in the, hi, I'm Anna. Um, I apologize if this was in the beginning of the presentation and I missed it. Are you doing this sort of information gathering with teachers in we, the schools? Yes, absolutely. We are doing it with um, as many members of the community as we can. And that community includes teachers, educators, administrators. Um, there's a school building committee that includes the administration of the town, counselors. Um, uh, we have just started the process, so I can't say that we've heard from everybody yet, uh, but we will. And the process of speaking to them um, will continue through SD. Uh, if I don't know if you saw the, well, it will continue through the whole process, but all of the big stuff will be decided by SD, uh, which is toward the end of the year. Yeah. So there are a lot of conversations that are going to happen with a lot of people. Uh, if there's Heather any. Has, Heather has her hand up. That she wants to unmute. Sure. Does, does that address your question, Anna? Yeah, I think so. I was I was curious if there was a focused, uh, like a specific focus group for teachers or not. Um, in a Kathy's nodding. Thank you. I assumed there was. I just wanted to confirm. Yep. They are critical in uh, design as they should be. I, you know, I would just add it, Anna. There's been a first, as Tim said, a first round. Um, but we're not at the point of it's what kinds of things, but then get feedback on the actual designs, where things go and how things fit together. So there's a lot of multi-use project base that is coming from the teachers and staff on, you know, is there storage space for the art rooms, for example, um, is the kind of feedback on how does that work? So it's, yeah. Uh, everybody, Thank I'm you. just going to interject here that we've got about two or three minutes left in the room. And uh, mostly to remind uh, Tim of that right now because he can't see the notice. And windows open. I'm, I'm going to just read a few more of the comments here and answer the questions as I can. Can windows open for fresh air? Yes, they will be able to. Uh, knowing you reach members of the community. Uh, e vehicle and e bike charging stations. Uh, e vehicle, probably. E bike, maybe. Think there's a need that I haven't read before. The school will definitely be designed as a community asset uh, for use by the community beyond the school itself. Uh, you know, the exact nature of that design remains to be seen, but certainly it will be a, a factor. If anyone has any questions in the minute that we have left, or statements, or happy to respond in any way I can. Thank you. For answering our questions. Sure. Thank you for showing up and providing feedback. Um, it's a valuable part of the process and it only makes the project better. Um, We've got about 30 seconds, just so you know. I think, I think, I think, I think everybody's have, spent. I think everybody is spent. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for your comments. We'll see you back in the main space. All right. Welcome back, everyone. I hope we didn't lose anyone in cyberspace. I think I think everyone made it back. Um, we have uh, plenty of time left, and I, I hope we didn't feel that we were rushed at all during the breakout. So I think we, what we'd like to do is just share a little bit what we heard and uh, give this an opportunity 
to um, ask some other questions if you may have or add through the chat. What we have done is we have created the chat so that you can only speak to the hosts, which is Denisco, but we will absolutely um, reiterate your comments in the chat room. But I would like Vivian first maybe to see if there was a common theme that you learned throughout your um, two breakout sessions or what, what people are thinking are priorities. Yeah, it was, it was great. Um, although I wish we had more time so folks could actually, we can have a chat about it, but it is challenging when we have a lot of folks. Um, there was a uh, definitely some themes, right? For the new, for the new or renovated building. Um, natural light was one very um, common theme. And again, as we look to how students learn best, we know that natural light really does have an impact. Um, community resource, again, is very important. Um, scaling the building and spaces for younger children and for smaller groups and, and community gatherings. So flexibility is, again, um, a very important theme. Um, there was also comments, uh, this was in the aspirations group um, about climate resiliency and just uh, action focus. So I think some of these comments may have come after Tim's conversation, some maybe not, but again, these are just a few of the many comments. And um, we're gonna have these um, kind of summarized Right, so that folks will be able to see what other comments came up. But those are just a few of them. Tim, do you want to share about some of I your mean, there was certainly a common thread through the discussions in both of the groups. It seems um, uh, certainly a good understanding of the balance between providing comfort and all of the things that the kids using the school don't have now in terms of air conditioning, daylighting. Um, uh, an environment that will allow them to focus, learn, and 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 be kids, uh, and you know, balanced with uh, all of the realism of building a building, installation, what it takes to make these goals happen. Um, it, it's uh, sort of a, a different focus or approach to the same things that Vivian talked about. Oh. So I think um, all of the effort and work that the town has done, both from the educational perspective and net zero and the importance of climate net zero sustainability has really come through and we hear you loud and clear and we're really excited to present the options and see which options really resonate with the priorities, especially as they tie to education and um, net zero and sustainability. If I think people can chat, um, we can receive your comments and then we can um, speak them to the whole group and respond to them. If anyone has anything they would like to add or ask, um, we have plenty of time. Or I guess some people say, if there are no questions, it doesn't mean they're not interested. We've just answered them all, but I, I'm sure we haven't. <laughs> okay, so we did get a, a question regarding the new floodplain maps. Um, so yes, we, we will be updating our uh, maps of and, and the constraints of the Fort River site with the new uh, floodplains. And we will take that into consideration with all of the other constraints that are on the site. Um, I could actually go back to the other site because I think what's important to note is with all of the condi site conditions on the site, the floodplain really doesn't play as big of a role in it as do some of the other constraints between the conservancy and the wetlands. We have a wetland coming right through here, so we have to be respectful of that. But we're, we're gonna, um, we're setting up the meetings um, with Conservation Commission, Planning Department, 
and all the necessary folks to ensure that all of the um, constraints and, and limits are identified are still accurate. So we will be going through that. And the more we can pull back, that's great. Uh, it, it's it's rare that you have not one but two sites to consider. It, it sounds crazy, but you actually are in a much better position than many of our other communities that we work with. If you if you could believe it. We will be doing um, the traffic studies as started today. Uh, we will be, we had to, well, we wanted to, we, we didn't have to, we waited until the university was back, as we understand that greatly impacts and informs your traffic. So we will be, we started it today. We're out there looking at both sites, all of the intersections, the patterns um, in and around the school, but also the crosstown traffic and how that might impact both sites. We'll also be doing actual traffic counts and that takes a little bit, but we hope to have this done, Tim, I believe they said in a couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, they were out at uh, Fort River today. They will be at Wildwood next week and then continue monitoring at major intersections in town so that they can fully understand the patterns of traffic. Um, and then we'll have a report within a matter of weeks. And one question just came up, regardless of the site, can students remain in, remain in the existing school during construction? So if you're asking if it is a renovation addition, will the school, will the children be able to stay in the school while it is occurring? Um, it will have, they will have to, it has to be done. There's no, what we call swing space. And so there's no other place to relocate the students. We might be able to take advantage of a few classrooms, depending on the timing for when the sixth grade actually moves um, to the middle school, but the majority of the student population is gonna remain in the school. So we do this frequently and we'll have to create a plan that will allow for the students to remain in the school in a safe environment while construction occurs. What this is called is phase construction and it's going to be a little portion of the school modified, move the kids to that, modify, you know, or, or update another part of the school. So there are a lot of moving parts and it typically the construction takes a little bit longer, but we would absolutely make sure that the students are able to remain in the school while there's um, construction going on. And another question came in, will potential use of the building site that is not selected be part of the criteria? That was, um, thank you for asking. We started having that conversation and originally we thought that we should absolutely put that in as part of the criteria. But the more we thought about it, it's a little hard to say what if now when there isn't an actual site or a plan for the school. So for the current right now, as we look at all of the options, um, that won't be one of the considerations, but I think those conversations need to start occurring within the town. And then when the final evaluations come out, that could be part of the conversation. Someone asked what our experience is with renovating a building and making a net zero. And then if we could provide a cost comparison of building new net zero versus renovate net zero. So, we have um, completed two schools that are net zero and they were both new schools, but that doesn't mean that we can't apply the same principles, whether it's a renovation addition or a new school. We understand that the bylaw actually for the net zero says um, of the new part of a renovation addition, but our goal would be to make the whole school um, a, a net zero. So it doesn't necessarily the net zero doesn't scare us or, or, or prevent us from thinking that we couldn't do this uh, with a renovation and addition option, just like we would make sure that it has the same envelope consistency, the same windows. Like er, you're gonna walk into a renovation 
addition building and and it's all going to look the same right so so we're not saying the renovation part's going to be less quality than the new portion of it um, and and as far as the cost comparison we absolutely will have a cost comparison for any or all of the options as we move through so there will be a cost comparison of a new building and with all of the criteria that the town has established as well as a renovation addition with the same criteria weighed against it. Uh, when will geophysical studies be completed for ground source heat pumps and geostructural issues, if any? So Tim, do you wanna take that? Sure. Um, we have, or geotechnical engineer uh, performing the initial feasibility study. And then as we narrow in on where we will be doing, they will be doing test bores probably within the SD phase, which is this year. And that test will, you know, give us the conductive capacity of the ground, let us know how well the wells perform if we go that route um, and how many we would need and how much of the site we will take. So the very initial phases of the study and will are happening right now uh, and we'll have a better sense by the time we reach SD, which is the end of the year. So I think just, just to add to that, we have enough information right now to make an educated evaluation of the two sites and the impact um, that, or, or what is gonna be required for geothermal. So, you know, we have one site that has high water tables, the other site has some ledge or, or, right? So we understand the attributes of each site and we're gonna be doing a comparison on the geothermal and what that means to each site. So for example, if we have a, you know, I, I'm just, we don't know 100% yet, but maybe 110, 115,000 square foot building, and we want to achieve net zero utilizing geothermal, we know we will be able to determine how many wells um, in an order of magnitude at this phase that we'll need on both sites based on the geological information that we currently have. And then once we do determine a site, will then get into more, we'll actually do test wells and, and make sure and verify all of the um, previous assumptions. Someone had asked, will the building include preschool as well as K? No, the preschool is going to remain over at Crocker Farm. So this will be solely uh, K through five and Crocker Farm will continue to house the integrated preschool program. Um, someone had asked, so how much longer knowing that could inform our response to that idea? I'm not sure what that was responding to, maybe the geophysical studies. Uh, someone asked, do we imagine this will be a single story or two story? And if not single story, can a reno support two stories? Uh, really, really good question. So um, it, it is, we can almost say with certainty that this will be a multi-story school and that we really, um, based on all of the requirements that are needed for say 115,000 square foot building with the existing buildings on site, as you can look at the screen, it would be really difficult. These are 82,000 square feet, right? So it would be very difficult to make it a single story building. And then there are other reasons um, to make it a multi-story building. But to respond to the renovation and addition option, we're exploring that. We would not make the existing school or the renovated part of the school a multiple, multiple story um, portion of, of a renovation addition option. It doesn't have the structure to support a, additional stories to it. If that helps. Uh, are the slope parts of Wildwood sites suitable for PV arrays? Tim? Um, possibly the northern site. I mean, we will study this all in depth. I, we can give you general answers that the site is sloping to the south, so it is possible. Um, that is the orientation that you would want. 
Um, the sloping sites with the mature trees to the southeast part of the site, I think, would be off the table because we wouldn't want to have those things. But yes, uh, the area to the north of the site um, may be ideally suited if we didn't want to put it either over the parking or on top of the building itself. Um, when you're driving down Strong Street, uh, you are looking down at the building. Um, so if there's a question of where the community would prefer to see the solar panels to be honest, uh, they, the green space between Strong Street and the school site might not be the preferred option. Okay, so I, I'm sorry, I got a clarification. Um, the, the question was if a renovation addition would take longer due to phase, construct, phase construction, how much longer versus new construction? We need to vet that. Uh, we need to understand what is going to remain in the existing building and what would be new and how we can phase the students based on uh, the, the solution that we come up with. We also need to work with the school department to determine how many spaces, if the sixth grade moves out, could we actually utilize um, that would be vacant at that time. Um, I don't know, I, I think I, I could ask my team here, I, I don't think we're prepared to say if that's three months, six months, or a year at this point. No, I didn't think so. It, yeah. Go ahead, Vivian. It, it really just, it depends on the scope of work within the existing building for a renovation project, right? Um, whether we take down part of it, build new, there's so many considerations. We often think um, you know, new construction is just easy because it's kind of like a one and done, but uh, phasing in an existing building adds complexity. Um, but that said, you're not building foundations and, you know, additional spaces that are already there. So again, as Donna said, we have to vet the scope um, and really understand how existing spaces can be re configured to meet the uh, the program before we can really get into the schedule. So there was one question um, in a multi-story school if the elevator breaks the second story is inaccessible to some of the student uh, school population with disabilities and how do we address that um, in our recent history um, we have designed we've we have not designed a single story building i'll say it i'll say it differently uh two to three um, story buildings is typical three even more so lately given the available space that uh, districts have as as far as buildable spaces um for example one point we just had a, we just completed two two schools on 1.7 acres the whole site so, so you have to get creative in a lot of instances. Um, the, the elevators should be maintained and managed throughout the year. You should have annual contracts, et cetera. Uh, we have not encountered, and we do get calls all the time from our um, cl past clients. They, they call us all the time for, hey, this happened, hey, this happened. But it's rare that we hear anything about elevators breaking. However, with that said, should there be an emergency and the students need to evacuate the building, then we have special mobile chairs that would actually um, bring the students downstairs. And we discuss the options uh, with the school department as well as your emergency personnel. Uh, Uh, the renovation versus new is a, is such a big question for the town. What are the top considerations in that? And when do you anticipate making that choice? So we agree it's a, it's a very big consideration. We establish the priorities and um, we, we wanna make sure that any solution meets them from an educational perspective, from a cost perspective, and then all of the other considerations will also need to be weighed, such as duration and disruption to the students. 
So all of these will be vetted between now and June when we make a preferred um, solution to be submitted to the state, to MSBA, if that helps you. Um, can you remind us when the site decision will be made? The site decision, again, uh, will we're for the preferred, for the preliminary design program, we're not taking any site or any option off the table. Uh, we would like to take the enrollment option of the Fort River only students, and, and we're hoping MSBA will agree with us, but we're not taking any options off the table, whether it's a renovation addition or new construction at Wildwood or Fort River just now. So we will be making that decision as well in, by June when we establish our preferred solution. Our preferred solution in June will be, we want a renovation addition at the Wildwood site or new construction at the Forbert. So, and, and, and the program will be established. Uh, the size of the building will be established. So we'll be making that decision in June and we will be back to you as we start looking at all of the options and the implications of all the options, including cost, educational program, um, duration of construction, disruption to students, all of that will be brought forward to you before any final decision is made. Uh, life cycle carbon analysis, um, it, it, life cycle cost analysis, I think, um, yes, yes, we will be reviewing the life cycle cost analysis for multiple different um, considerations. A, a lot of times we do this based on for the types of mechanical equipment that you select. That's usually uh, the, the biggest life cycle cost analysis that we would consider um, because you need to know it might be your most expensive first cost, but it from the longevity of it, your actual your operational costs are less if, if your first initial cost is a little bit more. But we will be doing that life cycle cost analysis for all of the systems and then comparing them to the options, whether it's a renovation addition and new construction. Someone asked, given the high water table of Fort River with a renovation with the existing floor slab be able to be treated for moisture resistance. I th Rick was saying he has a hard time unmuting himself. When I promise we didn't do that to you, Rick, on purpose, but maybe um, Tim, want to take sure. that? Um, yes. Um, if it is a renovation, there are multiple ways that we can address moisture coming through the slab. There are coatings that would go on top if we are keeping the slab, uh, moisture mitigation. It's a liquid applied and it actually works very well. Uh, if we are removing the slab, which we will have to do uh, where we're moving plumbing or making other structural changes to get to footings, um, we can put a vapor barrier below this lab that is impervious to water. So um, issues with moisture um, are able to be dealt with. Um, we would have to understand exactly what's happening, but uh, whether it's above or below the slab or if it's a new slab, um, it could be just as impervious as a newly constructed building. And then I, I do wanna go back and um, thank you um, for clarifying. She, she really did mean life cycle carbon analysis. So thank you. You're talking about the carbon as it relates to construction materials, transportation. So even though you know, tearing down an entire building, there, there's obviously some carbon impacts on that. But as you build new, there's also carbon impacts on that. And uh, we can certainly do a similar uh, cost analysis or, or life cycle carbon analysis to um, determine the different impacts on carbon, whether it's a new or a renovation project. Um, someone asked, do we have goals around the percent of different stakeholder populations that we're trying to reach and hear from? And how do we measure success, a successful community engagement? Our, our goal is to reach as many people that um, we possibly can. We are trying in many different ways to reach out to everyone. We are actually trying or having a 
conversation about possibly even just having a community forum solely in Spanish for those people that perhaps um, are uncomfortable or didn't realize we had translation services available for this. So our goal is to reach out to as many people as possible. We have a, Kathy, I don't know if you would like to weigh in on that. I don't know if I can unmute you. Um, if there's something you would like to weigh in on that, or we have actually Margaret Wood, our OPM is also here this evening. Brian, can you unmute Kathy? Hi. Oh, there you go. Uh, yes, and, and Phoebe Miriam is, is on too. You know, we, we're looking at um, linking up and we Phoebe has already to the the governor organizations, the parent groups within the schools, um, and also taking some work out into the community. I mean, this is, as you can see, a very early stage, but trying to make sure people know what's happening. Um, and at the point, uh, the uh, what the school might look and feel like. Um, I think you've talked about doing some workshops within the schools where people move around to different areas and sort of say, where do you put the library? Where, where is the gym? You know, and really starting to get a think of once, once we're getting from just generic options. So I, I think it's difficult. I mean, we, Zoom is one technique, but it's clearly a difficult time to think of how we do something where some of this would ideally would be in person, but we are working our way through it. What we're hearing um, from superintendent is, well, hopefully things are calming down a little bit, but there certainly was uh, enough. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take down my, thank you. I'm gonna, so everyone can see everyone's faces, um, if that's better. Um, we understand the families have been um, stretched over the last several months. And so we're hoping that with uh, the positive numbers that we're seeing for COVID these days that things maybe, maybe are turning. And so our goal is to continue the outreach, whether it's in person, as Kathy mentioned, or um, other ways of engaging the different um, people and, and what works best for them. Uh, that was Allison. Does anyone have anything else? We'll be posting this. Um, not, we're obviously going to cut some 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 of this uh, meeting, but uh, we will be posting this, the recording, the transcript, of course, edited, as well as the breakout sessions. So we will be posting it, and then um, there was I actually, if you don't mind. Um, it, you can, everything will be posted on the uh, website. I'm just going to get there and then share it with you all. Sorry, I'm going to share, share my screen one more time. So here we are. So we'll be posting this, the recording, the transcript, what we heard and learned out of the uh, breakout sessions at right here at the Amherst um, School Project website. Uh, Debbie Westmoreland has been amazing and willing to accept everyone's comments. So if you have anything that you would like to express or share, that would be wonderful. The um, next community forum is March 9th. And at that point in time, we'll have concept options for you to look at along with the associated costs with them. So we will be bringing this to you before we submit it to MSBA, which is the pre preliminary design program. Margaret, you're, you're here. I finally see your face. I don't know if there's anything you would like to add or. I really don't other than to thank everyone for coming. Awesome. So we really appreciate um, everyone's thoughtful input in this. And this is just the beginning. And we will continue to have these. And hopefully at the next meeting, we will have more answers 
than, than we do tonight because this is just the beginning, but we understand, we think we understand where the priorities lie within the community. And we, our goal is to present everything in a very transparent and open way. And we appreciate your questions to us, which um, are not, you know, help us make sure that we clarify if we're not clear with what the answers are. And we hope to be back March 9th, see you all, and presenting multiple options at that point. We have a visioning session, our final visioning session on March, on February 17th. You're welcome to join that. That's focused more on educational than it is on the site, the buildings, renovation, addition, new construction, or sustainability. So that's why we wanted to have this separate conversation. That's the 17th. We'll be presenting to the school committee, uh, the draft educational program that's coming up as well as the final one, but we'll be back before you on March 9th with the options that we're considering to submit to MSBA. So thank you everyone. Um, and we really appreciate your time this evening. Thank you, good night. Thank you. Thank you team.